nobody raises their hand. And, and Adora raises her hand, and she asks the most interesting questions. And I thought, whoa, that young teacher has really got it together. And, and afterwards, you know, I'm cleaning up, putting stuff away, and sometimes people come up to talk to me. And, and that was the case. And Adora and her mom were waiting patiently behind everybody else. I realized that was going to be a longer conversation. And then Adora came up and she said, hi, I'm Adora, I really liked your talk. And she started asking more interesting questions. And, and I said, what do you teach? And I think she said, I'm 12. <laughs> and, and I said, well, what are you doing? You know, I guess I didn't ask that. I should have known you were presenting. And, uh, and her mom was there. And I said, well, tell me what you do. You clearly, by the nature of your questions, have experience. She said, oh, I teach 300 people how to write online. They're from all over the world. I give them tips. I motivate them, right? And she went on about this incredible community that she consults to. And I was stunned. And at that moment, I invited her to present here. I, I just had to do it. And I'm quite proud of this. Her mom just told me that I'm the fastest ever inviter. <laughs> that, that, that I'm the fastest. That it usually takes a lot more explanation, and adults don't invite her, and it takes a long, 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 long time, and it took me about all of two milliseconds to figure out that Adora ought to be sharing her experiences um, as, <laughs> as a learner who really has put a lot together, some of it self-directed, some of it I'm sure with guidance, but I'm sure you will enjoy Adora's point of view. I think we should make it a point to listen to children as often as we can, and in fact, I'm sorry that you don't have two kids sitting next to you right now. So you could turn to these kids and ask them what they think of Adora's ideas. So imagine you have two kids sitting next to you and, and how they might respond to these ideas. And without further ado, Adora, would you come up? Say hi. Okay. Uh, is my microphone on? Is this? Oh. Okay, it might be a little far away. Um, oops. Should I use this one? Oh, you can hear me? Okay, good. Um, yeah, now what Alan neglected to mention was that, uh, very intriguingly, his suitcase was wide open on the floor, and that was the messiest suitcase I've ever seen. <laughs> that was pretty intriguing. That was why I went up there. I was thinking of asking some questions, but no, I'm just, just kidding. Um, so. I've been really enjoying the LC10 so far. It's a wonderful conference. I've been going to workshops all day long, pretty much, and um, yeah, it's a very mind-blowing experience. So, as Alan said, when you guys raised your hands, if you felt a little bit overwhelmed by all the learning, I saw a lot of hands go up. And I have to say, I, I really should have put my hand up because it's a very busy, very interactive, very interesting conference. So today I'm here to talk um, about my point of view on an innovative classroom, you might be wondering what gives me the ability or the credentials to do that. Well, my name is Adora Svitok, and at the age of seven, I published my first book. It's called Flying Fingers, Master the Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Writing. And since I published that book, I started going around to classrooms around the world, as well as in the U.S., talking to the kids about why reading and writing was important. From there on, it went to speaking at hundreds of schools over video conferencing and distance learning. And I would go to conferences and talk to teachers about what I did and how to engage students in the classroom. And talking to teachers, teachers are actually one of my favorite audiences, administrators and educators, because you guys have a great impact on students and on the way they learn. So I just wanted to start out by getting to know my audience a little bit. Now for some investigating. <coughs> Who are you exactly and what is it that you do? These are the questions that I want to find answers to because I know that there are a lot of teachers, but there might also be a lot of administrators or technology coordinators. So please turn on your voting devices and just quickly tell me, and I'll start the vote, what is it that you do exactly? Vote now. Teacher, administrator, Technology coordinator, media specialist, or librarian, student, Russian spy, other. So, on your active expressions, if you need any help, you can 
find one of the people in the orange shirts who are walking around just to tackle them and demand how to use these. Basically, you turn it on with the button right here, and you will have some choices as to what you can answer. And you hit A, B, C, D, E, or F. And let's see how many votes have come on in. Looks like quite a few, so I will go ahead and stop the vote. No, no second chances. All right, so it looks like the majority of you are teachers. 30% of those of you who answered said teachers. So it looks like uh, a lot of you are also administrators. Um, and quite a few of you are also technology coordinators, media specialists, and librarians. I do see that 2.5% of you are apparently spies lurking among us, which is very interesting. Uh, I will warn you that you will not pick up very much information about the US government by being here. You'll uh, learn more about students and technology. Very interesting, nevertheless. And where are the students in the room? Stand up if you're a student. See a student? See some more students? There are two students sitting next to you. If you want to hear their point of view, just you know, walk over and ask them after the session. I highly recommend it because uh, we really do have a lot to say. Well, now on to the point of my presentation, and that is about innovative classrooms. So when I say innovative classroom, what do you think that calls to mind? Any ideas? What do you think of when I say innovative classroom? Yes? Very good definition, doing new things with old tools, new tools, whatever's available to work magic in their classroom. That's a very good definition. Uh, and sometimes when I talk to people about an innovative classroom, and sometimes honestly when I think, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of an innovative classroom, as far as a picture in my head, sometimes I think about kind of the tables, the chairs, the technology, the way everything is arranged. And according to Encarta, the word innovative the word innovative means new and creative, especially in the way that something is done. So it's kind of interesting that I have that specific vision of a classroom arranged in a certain way. And though these things may contribute to an innovative classroom, today I'm really here to talk more about the human part, about leadership. So uh, as far as leadership goes, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of leadership? Presidents, prime ministers. Um, no matter what you think of when you first think of leadership, probably the first few images that come to your mind are of grown ups. How many of you would say that's true? When you think of leaders. I see a lot of raised hands. And what comes to mind when you think educational leadership? Principals, school district superintendents. In both cases, I do think that most people will think of a lot of adults, which I wonder about because according to the Encarta definition, leadership means the ability to guide, direct, or influence people. Nowhere in that definition is it mentioned that leadership is specific to adults. So why don't we think of more kids when we think of leadership? That is something that I would like to change today. If leadership means the ability to guide or direct or influence, then surely we have that ability just as much as some of our adult counterparts do. And if innovation means new or creative, especially in the way something is done, then giving kids the chance to lead, especially in education, certainly means innovation. What's more, I think that kids have a lot of experience with innovating, doing new and creative things. But I wanted to hear from you. What do you think that leadership means? <coughs> Any ideas? Clear vision. Clear vision. Anything else? Courage. I'm sorry? Courage. Courage. Inspiring others. Inspiring others. Willing to take risks. Willing to take risks. Willing Responsibility, listening, listening. 
guiding. And one more thing that you think of when you think responsibility. <coughs> Making tough choices. Okay. Great, so looking at this definition, and the definitions of leadership from the people in the audience, uh, I see clear vision, courage, inspiring others, willing to take risks, responsibility, listening, guiding, making tough choices. How many of you have encountered a kid, maybe in your classroom, maybe one that you know, who has at least one of those qualities? I see a lot of raised hands. I have encountered many kids who have one of those qualities, or maybe more. And so this is my goal today, to show you why kids can be wonderful leaders and great leaders, especially in education. So giving my generation the opportunity to lead, there are a lot of reasons why this can bring innovation to our schools. Uh, ask yourself, what should leadership look like? And I'm hoping that you'll see many more youth in the picture. My presentation is called Leadership from the Ground Up because it truly is from the ground up, a grassroots approach. Barack Obama really won the presidency because he utilized this grassroots approach, getting people, no matter their age or their position, to campaign for him across all walks of life. And so no matter your politics, it's easy to imagine how classrooms and schools could benefit from the innovations that student leadership could apply, could bring a similar ground up approach. In case you're a little wary of test driving this concept without having seen it already, having seen leaders, then I have quite a few examples of leadership from kids. Um, so here are a few pictures. You may be familiar with some of these. 12-year-old Craig Kielberger founded the well-respected charity Free the Children at 12 after reading about the plight of child laborers. Alec Lores founded his own nonprofit, Kids vs. Global Warming, after watching An Inconvenient Truth. Tabby Gevinson started the widely read fashion blog, Style Rookie, at age 11, and uh, really campaigns for girls' rights everywhere. Uh, Jasmine Lawrence founded Eden Body Works, a line of natural body <coughs> care products, after a traumatic barbershop incident. And Alexandra Scott, <laughs> she uh, lost all her hair because of some of the chemicals. And then Alexandra Scott, who's uh, Alex Lemonade Foundation, Lemonade Sand Foundation continues to raise money. She raised over $1 million for pediatric cancer care research uh, using her own lemonade stand. Obviously, these are examples outside of this conference, but there are many kids here at this conference who are doing a lot to lead. If you need examples, just say hi to Zoe or Kelly or Blake, uh, who are, I'm hoping, all here in the audience, and you will hear a lot about what they're doing, co-presenting, learning, and leading here at BLC. As for myself, I love to write from a young age, and when I was seven, I published my book. From there on, I went spreading a message of literacy and loving learning. Recently, I've actually begun my own event. It's called TEDx Redmond. How many of you have heard of TED? See some raised hands. So TED is basically this conference in California where a lot of prestigious thinkers and doers come to share what they're uh, up to. And TEDx events are kind of independently organized versions of that. So TEDx Redmond is entirely organized by kids for kids. I'm working with a committee entirely made up of students. And this is to show the world, really, that kids can take the lead. We're having a lot of speakers who have done great things, set up nonprofits. Um, and so TEDx Redmond is hopefully my example of what kids can do. And I'm not here to plug my event, although I will quickly plug the fact that it's on September 18th and it's live streamed. Um, but I want to say more about its message of power to the students. And the reason that I believe this is important is because we have a lot of messages to share that sometimes are left out of what we usually hear in the news or when we talk to adults about decisions and education. And I think we really need to bring this voice to the forefront. Um, now, I quickly want to ask a question. Can you guys see me when I'm over here? Not really, sorry. It's a, it's a little difficult. I have to um, run over here to change my slides sometimes. Um, so I'll try to stand like this a little bit. Um, now, as I've shown from some of the examples of kids doing great things, we are able to reach out and bring new ideas, new nonprofits, uh, really a range of inspired thinking to the world. So with our extracurricular activities ranging from starting charities to 
bringing new ideas, organizing events, publishing books, um, really a whole range of things to the world, then our intercurricular activities and our schools need to embrace that, need to reflect that. Instead of being the exception, kids doing great things should be the norm. Why? One reason kids leading in their schools is a topic that's very important to me is the issue of fair representation. In the 1700s, the Americans protested the British policy of taxation without representation, so I sort of coined the phrase education without representation. While I'm not planning on tarring or feathering anyone for sometimes leaving a kid's voice out of decision making, I do believe that we deserve to have our voices heard when it comes to education. And the things that affect us are our schools, our classrooms, what we learn. And leaving kids out leaves out a voice that can often bring fresh, new, creative ideas. Those of you who have watched my TED speech heard me talk about why a kid's voice can be often so important, so different. Maybe you've had big ideas before but thought, that won't work, that's too risky, that'll cost too much, that won't benefit me. You might have stopped yourself thinking about all the reasons why not to go ahead with it. Uh, and a big complaint in education that I've heard a lot is that too many aren't concerned about what's best for the students, but what's best for themselves. And I know the audience here is different because you're here learning about ways that you can improve your students' learning. But I think that having kids at the table brings a new voice, one that can advocate for themselves. And I also worry sometimes that too many educators are afraid to be innovative because of some of the risks that it brings. To go outside of the box, it can come with discouragement. Today at the keynote, uh, we heard about Scratch, and I was actually the follow-up, and some teachers said that their biggest roadblocks were not students not wanting to use the technology, or were not that it was difficult to use, they said it wasn't that. They said it was sometimes the administrators, or uh, school leadership that might step in the way. And that shouldn't be the case. We need more innovation and less fear about it, less stagnancy. Past experiences or discouragements can provide powerful roadblocks to new innovation. And true reform can only happen when we're not afraid, when we're not afraid to walk new paths and go outside of the box. I think that kids aren't hampered as much when it comes to thinking about reasons why not to do things. After all, we're the people who've invented roller skating around the kitchen with raw eggs in our hands. <laughs> we still dream about things. We still dream big. This inherent wisdom doesn't have to be insider's knowledge. We can share this with our teachers, with the administration, with our schools, if we're given the chance. Kids already do a lot of learning from adults, and I think that adults should start learning from kids.